and welcome to a special one-on-one -on -one interview in tribute of ZIZ's 60th anniversary. We are going to be speaking with several past personalities of ZIZ and with me tonight is Mr. Clement Juni Liburd, a.k.a. the Big JL, <laughs> a, 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 a national icon in his own right. Thank you. But you got your start right here at ZIZ, yes? I sure did. Okay, well, we're going to be talking a bit about the early days, your experiences here at ZIZ, and give people a bit of insight in the er of the early days of ZIZ through your eyes. So let's start off. When did you start working at ZIZ? I started working here immediately after high school. I left the Bastia High School at, um, in 1968, and I started working here immediately thereafter. But first of all, Jason, I, I just want to say thanks. Before I get into any details about ZIZ, I'd like to say thank you to you and the management of ZIZ for inviting me as a past employee and manager to share in ZIZ's 60th anniversary, which I think is just tremendous. ZIZ has been a fount for knowledge, for social activities, for just about everything that a radio station is there for, for a country. ZIZ has been here for St. Kitts and Nevis and the wider Caribbean. So I just wanted to put that on board. Now it's our pleasure to have you. Now you said you came here right after high school. How old were you at the time? Um, I was 18. Mm. Started after that. Um, when I came here at ZIZ, it was under the management of uh, Mr. E. Kenny Osborne. He, he introduced me to broadcasting and he was trained by the BBC so I got a real BBC training about how radio stations operate and what we should say when we get on the radio as DJs. Okay, how did you get the job? Did you apply? Was there a referral process? How did you get it? Yeah, I applied to the civil service because I've had a love for broadcasting since I was pretty much in primary school at the boys school and I used to listen to a radio station in St. Lucia at the time called Radio St. Lucia. A young man by the name of Willie James hosted a show and I used to listen to that every day. The more I listened to Willie James from St. Lucia is the more passionate I got about getting into broadcasting myself. And so I applied to the civil service and I was accepted and I started my um, journey here at ZIZ. So what were your first set of duties? My first set of duties was to observe. For the, the first week or two, we got, got orientation and we were trained by the more senior um, announcers here who were here at the time. And um, that is how it went, uh, basically. Um, they introduced us to the concepts of broadcasting, what it meant to be a good broadcaster, what to say, what not to say. Basic and preliminary introduction into Broadcasting 101, as it were, and so that's how I got my start. I started off by, as I said, observing and getting to know everything because Mr. Osborne was passionate about people knowing not only how to get on the radio, but know the technical side, know how to operate so that if you're called upon to go out to record a service or record a cane fire, um, then you know what to do. So we got well-rounded training on broad in broadcasting. Okay, now you say your first duties were to observe. Now tell me about the first time you were actually in a, a hands-on position. Right. Um, Arthur Gray was here at that time and he was entrusted with the responsibility of um, giving me the hands-on experience. So I used to go in and observe him doing his 1115 record roundup. And then once I got the feel for it, I then wanted to do my own show. And so... Um, my first show, though, I was pretty nervous. I was, I, I was stumbling, I was stammering, and the stars was forever observing and saying, see, see, you're not ready. <laughs> you know that kind of way? You think that you want to, but there you get the opportunity, and look how you're blowing it for everybody, you know. But I was determined that this is what I wanted to do, and um, even though he kept a, a hawk-like view of what we were doing in the studios and so on, I not only wanted to impress him, but I wanted to impress my family. I wanted to impress people that I was the right man for the job, that I can do this. This is what I want to do in, in my life. I want to do broadcasting. And so I had to be a success from day one. My first show, um, um, I started to do regular shows, like this is your shift, and you come in and you work your shift. And so I had different shifts in the day, in the afternoon, in the night. And then I told Mr. Osborne, look, 
I want to do my show just like Arthur has his 11.15 record roundup and Luvina Maynard has the children's program. I, I want to do Soul Serenade. And so Soul Serenade became a reality shortly after that. Tell me about Soul Serenade. Soul Serenade was a show of soul performers, artists of the soul genre. Wilson Pickett, Percy Sledge, James Brown, the OJs, the Delphonics. Um, that era, Aretha Franklin, Etta James, you know, that era of um, music at the time that was very prevalent and predominant, um, I wanted to do that. And so I got the show. I had many artists because we had records at the time. Yeah, I, I think I've heard of them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we had the 78s and the 33 and the 45, but mostly 33s with the soul artists because we had a good library of um, recording stars. And so I went and I did my, my um, Soul Serenade from 3 o'clock. It was for two hours, from 3 to 5, and I felt good. And that show ended up being a blessing for ZIZ because revenue came in with that, and people from all over the Caribbean was listening and sending. I used to get an average of 50 letters per day to per, Soul Serenade. Per day, you said? Per day. I mean, every day. I mean, they used to tease me about it. But you'd see people writing in from St. Martin, the Dutch Islands nearby, Sabre, Stacia, Nevis, Montserrat, Antigua, the Virgin Islands, wherever ZIZ could be heard. We, because at that time, we were pushing about 20K, 20,000 watts of power. And so people all over the Caribbean that had uh, AM frequencies, and so on, AM was the thing at the time as well, um, tuned in and listened to Soul Serenade. I mean, some of my letters were blessed with kisses and um, smelt a little like perfumes. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it was definitely fan mail. Fan then. mail. It was mm -hmm. fan mail. It was fan mail, definitely. Mm. Okay, so you mentioned that, well, obviously Soul Serenade was a hit. Did you go on to produce any other types of programs? Yes, I did. Uh, after Soul Serenade, um, I had a program on the Friday nights uh, which was reggae oriented. So I had the reggae show on a Friday night, which attracted similar kinds of mileage, similar kinds of responses and so on. And so that was my second venture into producing a program on my own, doing things uh, for the benefit of the station and the nation at large. And then after that, I produced Hard Talk. Much later on talk show, as I got older and more mature, I wanted to do talk show because I wanted to uh, have people vent their feelings um, on how the country is being run, what's happening in their neighborhood, what are some of the issues they want to throw up for discussion. So we had Hard Talk. Can you tell me, Ron, what year did Hard Talk come about? Hard Talk came about um, in, a, in about 1995, 1995 to about 2000. Okay. We had Hard Talk. Um, I forget what night it was during the week, either Wednesday night. I think it was a Wednesday night. And was it well? Had talk. Was well received. Okay. Well received as well. Uh, it was not the first talk show on um, ZIZ, but it certainly was my introduction to talk shows as a whole. Okay, that's great. Now, let's go a little back to the early days. You mentioned um, it was Carney Osborne, mm -hmm. who was the general manager then at the time. Right. And you mentioned uh, a another gentleman, was it Arthur Gray? I Gray. Think it Arthur Gray. Arthur Gray. Can you tell me who else was working here at ZIZ uh, during your early years that made an impact on you? Well, apart from Carney Osborne, mm -hmm. who was from Montserrat, mm -hmm. you had Wilsey White, who was the chief announcer. He was the man who did the news, organized the sports, Everything that had a news basis, Wilsey White was the man for that. Bill Bramble was the accountant. So he, overs he looked at the books, made sure everything was good there. The minuses and pluses added up. Made sure everybody got paid. That's correct. That's <laughs> a priority. <laughs> so we had Bill Bramble, who later went on to become the manager of ZIZ after Cammy Osborne. You had Vincent and Arthur Gray, who lived in Greenland, near to Mr. Osborne. You had Lovina Maynard, Goldwyn Keynes. Uh, you had Tony Sebastian, who is the son of the late uh, Dr. Sir Cuthbert Sebastian, Governor General. You had um, Sonia, his daughter also worked there, Sonia Osborne. You had Mickey Phillips from Halfway Tree or Middle Island, I can't remember. You had uh, Martha Watts. Lost and Ghoul was the messenger, but 
uh, at times when an announcer didn't come. He was so um, versatile. He could be used as an announcer at times. So even though he was the messenger, if somebody didn't come to work, he was put to work in the control room. And he later did a very good job of announcing. So Laston Gould, cheers to you. Uh, Vida Leader worked in accounts department with Mr. John. Um, you had Van Rebop Southwell, um, Clive Keynes, a, a technician. The other guy from um, uh, Mac Knight, I can't remember his first name, he went Pete's. I know him as Pete's, but the thing that was distinct and distinctive about him was his accent. He had a Yankee accent when oh. he went on the radio. I think he had lived in the Virgin Islands for a short while, so when he got on the air, he yanked. And so this was a, a new dimension for me. Anyway, um, so you had him. Um, Pete's, you had um, Lauren, I can't forget Lauren, the cleaner. She always had something positive to say to the announcers. Uh, she cleaned the, the studios, she made it clean and fresh and nice, so I can't forget Lauren. Um, you had Lillian Caesar later on, Cheryl Ward, Conce Edwards, Bradley, Veer. You had uh, Sugar Bowl here for a while, uh, Jazzy D, and, um, and Barry came later, Barry Thomas. Uh, during the time that I was manager, you had people like uh, yourself come on board. Um, you had uh, Miguel, Miguel Leibert, Brian Francis, Chico, my good friend Karen, Lisa Eddy, yourself, and so on. So these are people who came later, but the original list of people who came when I was here are shortly after. Wow. That's quite, I'm, I'm amazed that you were able to, you know, remember that whole list of people and their yeah, impacts on yeah, you. Yeah. Now, how did your life change after becoming a radio personality? Because you're going from just the average Joe on the street right. to now a point where everyone knows your voice. Yes, um, that for me was what became amazing up to today. I mean, more people know me than I might know of them. Um, and it's because you're on the radio and you're heard and you're popular and people like you and so on. So it definitely transformed my life because I realized then that I was under scrutiny. And so you're under the microscope and you have to act a certain way. You have to encourage people. My whole thing is about being positive, sending positive messages to people and expecting positive outcomes. And so even though I was under the scrutiny, it was what I was trained to do in broadcasting and um, by attending the Pilgrim Holiness Church there in um, McKnight. Um, that gave me a kind of a moral, religious um, background, basis, if you will. And th the training I got there and the training I got here at the station, and of course in school and your home training, led to me being grounded and um, you know, making sure that I carry out what's expected of me and do it, as I said, in a positive, meaningful, impactful way. That's, that's, how, that's the only way I know. And this has continued with me throughout my life, that even though I'm popular, it doesn't mean anything to me. You know, I'm grounded, I'm rooted. And once you have that groundation and that foundation to build on, you can't go wrong. Do you find that, okay, this is going to be slightly off topic from ZIZ, but do you find that that grounding, as it were, is missing in today's media climate? Yes, it is. Um, because you find that people have had a different background, training. Um, the world has changed. And which change, people have become more adventurous and more lax, more relaxed in what they say and what they do. And so there has been a sort of shift of standards. I mean, when I listen to some, the American media and so on, it's like anything goes to today, you know, basically. And then um, later on, lawsuits evolve. And so one has got to be very careful. But the, the point is that, yes, the lessons that I learned back then don't apply today. Well, they do apply in a way, but people don't seem to follow them anymore. They are more or less doing their own thing and hoping for the best. Mm. Okay. Now, I'm going to dig back into your memory banks now. Uh, how many years did you work at ZIZ? Well, I would say, let's see, five, ten. I think I was here for about... Um, about 12 years. Okay, 12. 12 years. So, would, what would you say is your most memorable experience from your time here at ZIZ? There's so many of them. There's yep. so many memorable experiences. Um, I, I could say the first time I came to ZIZ, I was like floating around. I didn't want to leave the station. <laughs> you know, I mean, when I came in, so I came in 8 o'clock in the morning, I was still here 8 o'clock in the night because 
I felt so good. It was like I was floating. Time was just standing still. That was a, a meaningful um, thing for me in, to see that, you know, I, I was here at last where I wanted to be. My dreams have been all about coming to um, ZIZ and making an impact and broadcasting. So the first day of work was certainly a great day in my life because I realized then that I could fulfill my dreams. And so that was a good vantage point. There have been others uh, where we've gone out and done interviews and broadcasts with heads of state of government. I've had some very challenging interviews with some heads of state, um, with official people, so to speak, from other countries coming in. And I had the responsibility to interview them. Those were highlights, as far as I was concerned. When ZIZ was used, we used to have annual fets here at Christmas time, we would invite oh, open house. We had open house and people would come into the station to visit. We'd have a, a, a culture band in the yard with a steel band or a string band and then we'd have drinks from the bottling company and, and we would supply us with some pastry and so on. And those events, even though they seemed small at the time, they were impactful because People were getting to know us, we were getting to know them. It was all about sharing and giving back something to the community. And those stood out in my mind. So as I said, there have been many, many times, I can't think of one single um, episode that was super, you know, above all of them. They all seem to be very important to me, critically important. So you've had a, just basically had a very hit, a long history of memorable experiences. Correct, correct. Okay, good. Now let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum. What are, what are some of the most challenging moments here uh, uh, during your time at ZIZ? Challenging moments. Um, I think the most challenging moment for me was when I was sent home. Mm. I was sent home by the Premier at the time, the late Sir Robert Llewellyn Bradshaw. I came to work late. I had gone to an event the previous night at the Factory Social Center. And so I um, ran from Dorset through Greenlands, got home five. I was, should have been here to put on the BBC. <laughs> oh, I, I've worked the early morning schedule. You know? I know how important that BBC, that BBC program is. is. Right? You must hear those pips. Yes. And with Mr. Bradshaw, the BBC had to be on on time because he listened to all the news. And so when I got here at about five after seven, Mr. Osborne, the boss, was already here waiting. And he said, um, Judy, uh, work the shift, and then you'll have two weeks home. Two weeks home? For what? He said, well, the, the, the premier was very bad that the BBC did not start on time. And so you, um, you know, when you finish the shift, I still had to work the shift, even though I wasn't going to get paid for it. And um, I did the shift, and I got two weeks without pay for coming to work five minutes late. Now contrast that to today, where people could go in for hours late, and they think it's okay. But standards have changed. There's no big to the today. People go to work anytime. You know, there's not the same uh, devotion and dedication to getting to work on time. You know, it just seems as if there's a laxity that needs to be tightened up and getting to work on time and making a fair day's pay, a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. All these things need to be brought back in check. Um, so I was sent home. And you know what I did, Jason? I went to Anguilla. Why, why, why did you go to Anguilla? I had an opportunity to work on Radio Anguilla. They said, I told my friend down there that I have two weeks. He said, come Anguilla, we'll give you a job. So I got paid to go to Anguilla to work for two weeks. Um, to that took up a little slack because I needed that money to pay for a car, which I had at the time. So I went to Anguilla and I worked, and it was a good visit. I enjoyed Anguilla. It was my first visit to Anguilla. And I enjoyed it and made some very good friends down there at the time. And when I came back, I felt a sense of renewal, of rededication to ZIZ, even though when I left, it wasn't the most favorable circumstance. I see. Well, I guess all things work out for a good. good. Yeah, so that was, that was challenging. The other thing was um, having to go out during Christmas and um, things just went wrong, um, like we covered Carnival and I remember one evening we were covering something up at the park and um, things weren't working, the equipment, Arthur and I were up there and the equipment just wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't move and we were wondering how we're going to get this Calypso show out to the people, I mean here is it, people are listening, we, we, I was scratching my head, I didn't know what to do, I said call Sil Joseph. 
And that's a name I forgot to mention during the list there. Sil Joseph was the chief engineer here. He could get a sardine pan and turn it into a transmitter, if you will. <laughs> he, um, he's MacGyver then, basically. <laughs> he was that good. Okay. So Sil came over in less than no time after we called him. And, and uh, you won't believe how we called him. Because those days we didn't have cell phone. Eh? So we went to my neighbor's house to call his house. And he came in less than no time. He said, man, look, this is the problem. Boop, boop, boop. Bap, you're on the in five minutes. So that was a challenge for me because not knowing what to do at that time was driving me nuts. Because you need to know what to do when things go wrong so that you could correct it. And I didn't know, and, and that was just a challenge for me. So getting technical skills and so was a challenge for me. I mean, I didn't see myself as being technically inclined, but the boss insisted that you have to get the technical know-how. And that is what I tried to do. All right. Well, now you are the CEO and founder of Freedom FM. Ah. So did your time at ZIZ inspire you to found Freedom? Certainly. Certainly. I'll tell you, I always wanted to have my own radio station. It took me a long time. As a matter of fact, almost 60 years of my life. Um, I got to tell you, Jason, that I've been in the business of broadcasting now for over 50 years. And um, my mother always challenged me to, why don't you get your own? And I think the opportunity came. Nothing happens before it's time. That's another saying my mother left with me. Uh, you know, she has her pearls of wisdom. And that was one of them. And um, I remember I had worked at Van Radio for a while. When I came back from um, studying in the States, I couldn't get a job in Sinkits, and I had two master's degrees and a bachelor's. And so I got a job at Webo in Nevis and um, worked there for a while, came down here, worked at Sugar City Rock for a while. And uh, worked, of course, I started at ZIZ. In the US, I've done a little work at um, WLIB. And uh, so I had some groundings at different radio stations. My mother always said, you work for these people, you bring in, you help them uh, get their revenue going, and what about doing it for yourself? You're getting older now. Eh? You don't think it's time to stop work for people? And that left an imprint, an indelible imprint on my mind. And I decided to take up that challenge. And that's how freedom came into existence. And I remember I was looking for something to name the station. And it came to my mind, one evening, you have your freedom now. You have your freedom to open your own station. I said, Freedom FM. Born, just like that. And uh, we got the necessary um, paperwork in place. Um, Sugar Bowl was the first that came to me and he said, Jael, I understand you're opening a station, you know. I can't work for you. And then EK came and Sister Sensi and some other folks and so on. And we started with just the three of them. Bowl. Sensei and PK. One in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one at night. And that's how we started um, the journey uh, towards uh, Freedom FM's success and um, popularity. Okay, so what would you say ZIZ has taught you both in your professional career now and your own personal life? It has taught me to be true to who you are. Be true to who you are. Whatever you've committed yourself to do, do it. Don't BS people. Um, it has taught me to be honest in my dealings with people. Well, honesty plays an important role in business. It has taught me to make sure that um, the things that you put in place um, to enable whatever you're doing to work, make sure that they work. The, the contacts that you make, the equipment that you buy, Whatever it is that you put your mind to do, do it. So ZIZ left a message of hope, of understanding, of productivity, of blessing you know, with me. And that has stayed with me um, through Freedom FM and even now as we continue. Um, to be resourceful, to, to be decent when you're dealing with people and not take people and situations for granted. All these things, I would say, I got from the, the foundation and the people I interacted here in particular, people like Wilsey White, Bill Bramble, Lovina Maynard, Goldwyn Keynes, and so on. I mean, we used to have what we call ST sessions, talking sessions, where we sit with nothing much to do, things going good at the station, so we sit down and have a little reasonment 
And out of those talks and discussions came a lot of wisdom and understanding, if you will. Okay, great. So we're almost out of time. Uh, what find there are there are new persons, you know, younger persons here working at ZIZ right now on both radio, well, mm. mostly on TV, mm. but. From your many years in broadcasting, any final words of wisdom for persons working at ZIZ or in the media generally? In the media generally, I would say we have a long way to go still. I don't think that because you have a job, that that's the end all of it all. Make sure what you put in, you get out and more. You know? So I would say um, be consistent. Be very consistent in your approach. Um, take you, be professional. That's very critical because you find that people tend to get into situations and the level of unprofessionalism that they bring is absurd. You know, people need to be professional to, be, um, to make sure that they understand what they're doing, what they're getting into. Because sometimes you get into a situation and then you realize once you're in, you're in over your head. I would say there are people who work in the media who don't belong there right now. You know, um, because this is just another job for them. Uh, they're not committed to broadcasting. They're not committed to radio and television. It's just a job. They're doing it to when they find something else. So uh, if you're in the media like that, then maybe you don't belong there. You should find something else. I think media work is serious work. It's the, it's the, I've heard people say it's the fifth or the third estate of democracy. Uh, fourth estate, but the yes. Fourth? Fourth estate. Okay, I was in between. You're close. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, as far as democracy is concerned, that's what the media did. Shines the light on problems in the community with a view to getting them resolved. Um, and that is why I think more could be done here at ZIZ uh, when it comes to democracy. I think that um, the greatest challenge that ZIZ has to me is the politicization. I think that we need to get rid of that. The funny thing is, Jason, that when the opposition is in opposition, when the opposition um, is in opposition, <laughs> they tend to see the solution for ZIZ. They tend to see, well, we need to share the resources to all and sundry, including political parties and so on. But once they get in, they tighten the screws. And this has happened with every administration so far that has been at ZIZ. And this, as we move into 2021, I think the time has come to free up ZIZ. Um, to free it up from political control. Uh, there was a time back in the 1990s when an attempt was made, I think it was the Caribbean, the, the uh, CCN, 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 yes. CCN came with a view to looking at that. But the point is government still had the majority control and CCN had min minority shares. And so the government still was the critical factor in the decision making process. I think the time has come for ZIZ to be freed up uh, so that it can make inroads into the community in terms of getting everybody's voice to be heard and not just a select view. And I think this would be bound to with the finances and the accounts and so on that would be coming in because the station is freed up. More and more people would participate, more and more organizations would take place. People would see it, well, finally, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, ZIZ, free at last. This needs to happen. And I need to see it happen before I pass. This needs to happen with ZIZ. I hope I don't say anything wrong to get you into trouble. <laughs> I, I think I'll be fine. Okay, all right, all right. All right. But, thank but that's the challenge. All right. Well, thank you so much. This has been very informative. Thank You're you. a wealth of wisdom and insight. So I was very happy to speak with you about your uh, time at ZIZ, what you've learned, and you know, the sharing of your own pearls of wisdom. So thank you very much for yeah. being a part of our 60th anniversary celebration. It really is my pleasure, and I would like to wish ZIZ another 60 years of success, another 60 years of challenge, another 60 years of change, another change, another 60 years of dynamic growth. This is where I got my start. I don't regret it. I won't forget it. I love you, ZIZ. I wish you another 60 years. God bless you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you very much. I've been speaking with Mr. Clement Juni Leibert, former general manager here at ZIZ, and we've been reminiscing on his many years here at the station as we celebrate our 60th anniversary. I'm Jason Davis for One on One.